want to welcome you to our uh, meeting tonight. And uh, just once more, uh, just a quick reminder about a few announcements. Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, the prayer and Bible study. And that's continuing our series on the life of Gideon. And then, as I mentioned this morning, if you'd indicated that you might be able to help with our uh, Holiday Bible Club uh, over the summer, uh, be if we could meet for a short time just after, uh, either maybe even just gather at the, uh, in the church building here, and we'll have a quick uh, chat about just a few things we want to chat about regarding making some arrangements for that in the summer. So if you are able to, it'd be great if you could stay for a few moments, even as we do that. Uh, but we're going to begin our service tonight by singing a hymn. It was written actually at the start of the, the pandemic, this hymn. And we've sung it actually uh, a few times. One was over our Zoom meetings, and I think we've sung it once in the church here before. And it's been a, I know it's been a great encouragement to many. This was written by the Gettys. It's Christ, our hope in life and death. And I'm hoping that you remember this and can sing out enthusiastically. And it's not going to be just a quartet of us singing. But uh, no, I think you know this well. So we're going to uh, play this and uh, uh, let's stand as we sing this hymn together, please. I'm going to sing again this morning this great song that we've been learning over the last few weeks. It's called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. And it reminds us that in the risen Christ, our hope springs eternal. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives. Christ, he lives. Let's sing together.
what lovely words to that hymn and what a great encouragement it is to know that we have a blessed hope in Christ. It's a hope that won't fail. It's a hope that won't disappoint. And so we can come and give th- praise and thanks to God even now. Let's just do that as we come to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help for a time together. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for the blessed hope that we have in Christ Jesus. This is a hope that nothing can destroy. That our confidence, Lord, and we know we can place, Lord, this confidence in you. For, Father, you have proven yourself faithful. Time and time again in the pages of Scripture, we see how you have proved yourself again to your people. How you were faithful to your word. We've seen that affirmed even in lives of even those in our assembly as well. How you've kept them, how you've sustained them as well. Father, you are our hope, you are our confidence. And Father, our souls even belong to you. And so we thank you, Lord, that you're able to keep us by your power. By your power and your steadfast love, even until the end. Lord, you're the constant presence even in our life. You're our helper. You are our refuge. You're our strength, Lord, even when we feel weak. And so, Lord, we do pray that we would know and remember this glorious truth even amidst the the difficult times. But not just the difficult times, at all times. Father, we do remember those who aren't so well even at the moment. We do pray for for Ruby and Sadie. We pray for them as just in their recent falls, Lord, as well. Just continue to help and strengthen them. Continue even to heal their bodies as well too. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you continue even to help Tommy as well. And Father, we pray, Lord, even for, for others maybe even gathered here tonight with maybe own, their own private burdens, Lord, that maybe we don't even know about as well. But you know, Lord. You know all that is going on within hearts and lives. So Father, just help them, encourage them, Lord, by your word and by the wonderful assurance that this hymn that we've just sung gives us. This great reminder, Lord, that we're even guarded by faith even until that day. Father, it doesn't mean we won't face trials or difficulties. But, Father, you assure us of your presence even in the midst of the trial. Father, these trials, Lord, even prove even the genuineness of our faith. They sometimes even draw us, Lord, even draw us closer and deeper to you as well. And, Father, just... In the time of trial, help us to fix our eyes upon you. Father, help us even as we do that tonight, as we sing of these hymns, as we meet around your word. And Father, as we have fellowship, not just with you, but also even with one another as well. What a blessed thing that is, this great gift of fellowship, and this fellowship we have and access by faith that we have with you in prayer. And so, Father, just help us tonight and be glorified even through all that takes place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we began our time there with a a more modern hymn, but we're going to sing a a more traditional hymn now, and uh, this is one you'll know well. Uh, I'd ask the question, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Uh, It invites us to consider even whether we're continually even trusting in his grace. This is, of course, are you washed in the blood? And we'll just stay seated as we sing this wonderful hymn together. Thank you. For the cleansing power Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood?
bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're continuing our series and the Sermon on the Mount. And tonight we come to the last group of these Beatitudes. And uh, we find out that word Beatitude is, it comes from the Latin word for, for blessed. But we're talking about the movement and progression that there is between these. Uh, it's, it's like a momentum that carries us along because the first three of these Beatitudes relate very much to how we enter the Christian life. We enter by being poor in spirit and recognizing our great need of God. We mourn over our sin and we come to Christ by by being meek and humbling ourselves before him. But then, as we progress in the Christian life, we also desire the righteousness he provides. And we talked about how the next group relates not only how we relate to God, but also even how we relate to others. We hunger and thirst for, for that righteousness, but also we long to live that righteous lives when we, life when we walk with the Lord. We display mercy because we have received mercy as well. We're pure in heart because Christ has cleansed us and God has cleansed us from our sin. We are to be holy as he is holy. But what of the ongoing experience of the Christian life? Well, that's the, the next stage in the momentum as it carries us along with the next one of these Beatitudes. So we're looking particularly tonight at verses 9 to 12, but I want to just read once more from, beginning to read at verse 1. We'll start from there. So verse 1 down to verse 12, we're going to read tonight, focusing particularly on verses 9 to 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this is the word of God. And we ask for God's blessing even upon it as we study this passage tonight. Let's pray together briefly and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for this Sermon on the Mount. Father, for how it teaches about Christian discipleship, how it shows us, Lord, even 
how we are to live the, the good and blessed life, what that truly looks like, but also what is promised to those who live this life. Father, may this be an encouragement to us. May this be a, a help even to someone maybe even listening or watching this tonight. And Father, we do once more ask for your blessing upon this, at this time together. Father, as usually we do ask, Lord, that it wouldn't just be me speaking, but you speaking through your word. That even as this week goes ahead, Lord, maybe through this week, maybe as we face some, some trial or circumstance, may this maybe even be a help and encouragement to us. And Father, we want to give you thanks for how your word does speak into our lives. How it does show us how we ought to live. And so, Heavenly Father, just help us tonight once more as we proclaim it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning around the table, I was talking about how uh, Charles Spurgeon, you know, didn't exactly give great encouragement when we talked about the word finished and there was so much in it. Well, one of my studies this week, as I came around to study verses 9 to 12, I got a similar kind of encouragement from A.W. Pink because when he gets to this, these Beatitudes, uh, particularly when he begins this chapter on blessed are the peacemakers, uh, where do you hear what he, he started off with? So I was, I was sitting down to study this this week and I'd been writing out some of my own thoughts on this and then I started to get to the commentaries and he opened up A.W. Pink and he said, this Beatitude is the hardest of all to expound. At which point it felt like going for a cup of tea or coffee and coming back. But after that great encouragement from Mr. Pink, let's, let's try and move forward in this uh, as we consider this first attribute. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, every year the, the Nobel Peace Prize is awarded to people or organizations who have made significant advances to the promotion of peace. And if you look up the previous award winners, what you'll find is it's a mixture of people and organizations. Uh, people like Barack Obama have won it. Um, the United Nations, uh, organizations like Doctors Without Borders, who bring humanitarian aid in some of the most difficult situations. But throughout history, there have been many peacemakers. But yet so often, the peace that people have brought about has often been so short-lived. One writer remarked that in America, Washington has an assortment of peace monuments. There's so many of them. They're built after every war. The point is that, that peace brought about by simply human means often doesn't last. While it is sought and found, and it can, peace can be brought about for a while, the presence of conflict in our world remains. You don't need me to tell you that even back home here, even when uh, peace comes into our own land for a season, conflict soon arises even somewhere else in another part of that land as well too. And so there is this hunger and, and desire for, for peace. And Jesus says here that peacemakers are, are blessed. But the key question is, what kind of peace is Jesus talking about here when he says peacemakers? You know, this word peace, of course, is it's often associated with the gospel, isn't it? And not just in the New Testament, but throughout all of Scripture. We live in a world where it's said that, that man's greatest need is peace. But the greatest need of this world is the peace that only God can give. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2 and, and Romans chapter 5, he describes a situation in which peace is greatly needed. Because in those two chapters, he emphasizes that, he says people are described as children of wrath. Even by nature, we are enemies of God. By nature, our, we were born wanting to go our own way. Our, our, our sins had set us against God. They separate us from him. By nature, we're, without Christ, we are a people without hope. And without God. That's what Paul says in Ephesians. A people wanting, born, born wanting to go our own way rather than God. So our greatest need is peace. But it's a peace between man and God. That's the world's greatest need for peace. And in those chapters, Paul presents Jesus as the ultimate peacemaker. 
Because God has brought about a great work of reconciliation through him. We've just sung about that. That work of reconciliation even brought about through his blood. When you look at how the prophets describe God's Messiah, think about how even Jesus was described in the Old Testament. The prophecies about the Messiah, Isaiah 9, describes him as wonderful, counselor, mighty God, and what's the next title? Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. You see, this peace, this great reconciliation between us and God came about through a great cost. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. On the cross, Christ Jesus became the mediator between sinful man and God. And he didn't just become a mediator to to bring about that settlement, but on the cross, he actually bore the punishment for our sin. The wrath of God was, was poured out upon him. Not because of any sin on his part, not at all. He was spotless, he was sinless. But yet our sins were laid upon him. That's why the message of the gospel is often described as the gospel of peace. Because though we are born in sin and unable to approach a holy God, objects even of God's wrath by nature, and through through Christ's sacrifice upon the cross, he became our mediator. He became our peacemaker, our saving substitute. And it's it's no accident that Paul once more refers to that when he wrote to uh, the believers at Corinth. And he talks about it as being a message of reconciliation. That's how he refers to the gospel. That's 2 Corinthians 5. And he says, because those who proclaim this message proclaim how people can find true peace with God. And that's a responsibility of all of us. Not just a responsibility of a few, but all of us are ambassadors, as Paul talks about in that passage. We're ambassadors. We represent the Lord. I was speaking about that this morning, wasn't I? But the other aspect of this peace is not only are we reconciled to God, but we're also reconciled to one another. In Ephesians, that's a a particular uh, issue that Paul was, was speaking into. Because here was people who were mixtures of Jews and Gentiles, and yet now they were one. In Christ, they were one. Now those things that, that once divided them before, that those different cultures, those polar opposites that they were from before, now they have a new identity. Now they're first and foremost in Christ. Think about that. The Jews once regarded the Gentiles as unclean. They wouldn't even eat with them. They wouldn't even dare enter their homes. And think about it. Now here was these two groups sitting down together, breaking bread together singing praises to God together, meeting around the word together. You think about how that was a powerful testimony, you know, to others as we're looking on. They knew Jew and Gentile normally didn't get on, and yet here they were, sitting down together, meeting together. And that early church was such a mixture from all different kinds of people. There was those who were slaves, those who were free men as well. Those who were rich, those who were poor. And these, this was who formed the early church. See, here was the power of the gospel to not only change lives, but to change relationships as well too. The church was a mixture of people from uh, were different ages, races, backgrounds, status in society, came together to worship and serve God. And that was such a powerful testimony. You see, in many ways, a community such as this wouldn't make sense in the world around us. You know, when you think of different uh, community groups that there are today, it's maybe, they're maybe based on certain things that people have in common, uh, maybe shared interests. You know, there's cycling clubs, isn't there? We were, were driving on the, way, on, the, on the way to church today, and uh, we've seen about, uh, there's about 15 cyclists all coming the other direction. They obviously were, they were even dressed the same. They were part, uh, part of a, a cycling club. That was clear. You know, people form these groups based on shared interests. 
But in many ways, as the, the world looked on upon the early church, they would have thought, what could these people have in common? They were so different. Rich, poor, slave, free, Jew, Gentile. Yet here they were, meeting together, serving together. What a powerful testimony that is. Because they, had, they remembered what united them. And that's what Paul reminds them of in Ephesians 4. He says you're a new community with the same spirit, same faith, same father. You're sinners forgiven by God's grace. That's what brought them together and that's what kept them together. And you know that peace must be maintained as well too. So as a member of this community we're to pursue peace and maintain that with one another. He wrote in Ephesians 4. See he he. Though they were reconciled to God, and though they've been reconciled to one another, he urged them never to grow lax in that regard. To remember uh, the manner of which they were, had been called. To walk with humility. Walk with gentleness. Walk with patience. Bearing with one another in love. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Important principles for how in the church... We are to still maintain that peace as well too. Why are we to work at it? Because while here in this world we're still not perfect yet. We can still, maybe though we have something in common, sometimes we may disagree in some certain matters. We're all still people with different personalities as well too. We're still we're sinners forgiven by God's grace and we're still not perfect. But yet we must maintain that bond of peace. Why? Because if we want to serve the Lord, it's important we're all moving in the same direction, isn't it? Remembering what unites us. Remembering what our mission is. But what are the rewards promised to the peacemakers? To those who proclaim the message of peace. To those who are ambassadors even of this gospel of peace. Look at the reward they receive. They will be called sons of God. And the reason why God calls, uh, Jesus calls those who are peacemakers, sons or children, is, is simply because they are to be like him. Children often resemble their parents, don't they? When a child is born, they often, as uh, people visit the family, they often look down at the child and say, oh, he's got his, his uh, mum's eyes or their father's mouth or nose. Or... They, they, they see these similarities and they try to pick out the little features. Um, you see, God's spirit, the working within us, gives us that desire to want to be like our Heavenly Father. But also that spirit is cultivating that fruit of the spirit within our lives. Meaning we should be resembling our Heavenly Father, even in acting with compassion and showing love. And even displaying the fruit of joy, even long, long suffering as well. What a tremendous privilege it is to be called a son of God. There's a reason why sons are used as well. I'll talk about that in a little minute. Why it uses that expression. You know we were once rebels. Think about that. Once sinners separated from God. Once enemies and hostile to the truth. And yet now we can be called sons. Part of the, the family of God. And when we come to Christ. We're adopted into that family. And we enjoy the rights and the privileges. Of being in that family. We have access to the Father. We, he lovingly and graciously cares for us. But as sons, the son was the, the heir as well, you see. That's why the expression sons is used here. Meaning that we are heirs. We receive a glorious inheritance. A glorious inheritance. You know, well, we know we have a heavenly inheritance waiting for us in heaven. We know that that's a place which is unlike this broken world we live in. This will be a place that's incorruptible, undefiled. A place that won't fade away. And we will receive that glorious inheritance. That is our right and our privilege as, as heirs. You see, this is those who proclaim peace. Those who are sons of God are truly blessed. But then... Our next beatitude, well, again, these beatitudes, remember I say it's, it's kind of a countercultural message because the kind of things that it says are blessed might not be the, the things you'd expect. 
It's now he says, blessed are the persecuted. People, we don't often think those who are persecuted as being blessed, do we? That's not normally the sort of thing that people would say, oh, just wish it was like that. No, you don't ever hear people saying that, do you? But yet, let's pay attention to what Jesus says about those who are persecuted and, and how they're persecuted. Her persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, I want you to notice that this, this beatitude is not like the rest. There's some who say, is verse 11 maybe beginning another separate beatitude? There's others who say, no, verse 10 is the last, and verses 11 and 12 are, are there for another reason. And it's, in case you're wondering which group I belong to, it's the latter group. I would see verse 10 as being the last beatitude, and, and verse 11 and 12 as expanding on that. The reason why I say that is verse 11 and 12 is a different structure uh, than the rest. The, all the other formulas were blessed are those. And then it goes on to here is the promise as well. Another reason is that whereas the rest contain general statements, verses 11 to 12 directly address the hearers. Because notice how it's worded. There's a subtle change in the wording. Blessed are you. Notice that? All the rest of the Beatitudes say, blessed are those, or blessed are the, but now it says, blessed are you. So here is Jesus applying this attribute, or this Beatitude, to his hearers. Verse 11 to 12 expands on what's been said in verse 10. You see, it not only helps explain the last Beatitude, but it applies that to the hearers. And if you link the Beatitudes, it also links the Beatitudes with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll see this, God willing, next week when, whenever Jesus moves on to talk about being salt and light. But what does it mean to be, to be persecuted? Well, the word persecute comes from a word which in its very basic form means to put to flight or pursue. But Jesus says here that the kind of persecution that's blessed is when someone is persecuted for righteousness' sake. You see, persecution can take many different forms. And we see this even when, in, for example, the book of Hebrews. It can be physical attacks. It can even be economic sanctions. It can be other kind of attacks. Verse 11 speaks of even verbal abuse as well. Those who revile, meaning to criticize someone or in an abusive or angry, insulting manner. It speaks also of those who persecute even by making false accusations. Sometimes false claims can be leveled at believers or followers of Christ. Persecution is certainly alive and well in our world today. I was looking up some recent figures compiled just actually at the start of of uh, uh, the year. Figures compiled uh, and it found that, that uh, around 12 churches or Christian, or Christian buildings are attacked every day. That's what some of the stats found. 12 churches or buildings that belong to Christian organizations, at least 12 are attacked every day nearly in different parts of the world. Also, more Christians are murdered in Nigeria, more than any other country. Open Doors uh, took some figures from October 2019 to September 2020. And they estimated that between that period, there were some 5,678 believers killed during that time. And here was something else more shocking as well too. Think about recent developments with the pandemic. They were actually saying that the the pandemic has actually enabled religious persecution. You might say, Neil, how do you work that out? Well, what they found is that relief was sometimes withheld often from Christians in some of these countries. There was even some forced conversions in some countries, in places like Ethiopia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Middle East. People were being denied help during even the COVID-19 pandemic because governments were telling them, your church or God should feed you and just simply left them to it. That's what happened. That was a reality. That was happening. Persecution of believers is something that's spoken of in Scripture. It's something actually the Bible talks of often. So we shouldn't be surprised if we face it. 
We know often we face it in quite a a mild sense than, than some other places in the world today. You know, John Stott once said, persecution is inevitable because he said persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable value systems. In other words, if we're living godly, righteous lives and we're living for Christ, that can put us at odds with society around us. For example, if we value the biblical definition of marriage, we're often criticized for being out of step with society. That's the claim leveled at us. Also, if we pursue even self-control as well, our life will be markedly different from that of the world even around us. And yet the degree of of persecution can vary depending on even what country we're living in. For many in this world, we might face uh, ridicule from family members. You might even have other people not wanting to associate with you because of your faith. Or maybe even in the workplace as well. Sometimes our Christian values might not make us popular. You might wonder what I mean by that. Why would our Christian values make us sometimes not popular in the workplace? What about maybe a situation if ever you were presented, um, you were urged maybe not to present the full truth to a customer so your company could benefit from a situation? Or else if you were asked to bend the rules and regulations for someone? You know, if, if you were a Christian and, and you were in your workplace and you were seeking to live for God, There might be instances like that where people are urging you to compromise and yet you can't. You tell the truth to someone or you say, well, actually, that's not the way it works. Some bosses might not always like that. You know, for others, even living in places where persecution is even greater, it can mean imprisonment. It can mean death even as well. So we shouldn't be surprised if we do face persecution for living godly lives. But it's not just a case of people being persecuted for their good deeds or for their good character. This righteousness is speaking of. They're living this way because of Christ. That's the real reason why Christians face persecution. Verse 11 makes this clear. When, you, when all kinds of evil are said against you falsely on my account. That's the kind of persecution that's talking about. When you're persecuted for Christ. Because you're seeking to live as a believer. You're seeking to live and represent your Lord. Seeking to honor him in your life. But of course we don't normally count persecution as a blessing. Yet here Jesus says that those who are persecuted for righteousness sake will receive a blessing. He wants to encourage those who are being persecuted. Now remember, when Jesus was saying these words, here was disciples who were still young in the faith, only really initially out on this journey. And yet right from the beginning, Jesus is warning them about persecution. You think about even maybe what you know of how some of these disciples will even die. They were going to have to literally take up their cross. We know that church history even records that as well too. But what encouragement was promised to them, even in these early stages? It says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What do you notice about that promised blessing? If you've had your your coffee tonight, have a look down the list of Beatitudes. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Does it it sound familiar? It should do, because actually it's the same one that's promised at the very beginning. It was promised to those who are poor in spirit. It's, this is almost like two bookends, you see, to these blessings. It's the same blessing because it's the same underlying attitude at, at work here. Those who are poor in spirit, they are still in need of God. As we walk in the Christian life, we continue to need the Lord each day. We need his help. We need his strength. We need his grace. And as we grow more uh, Christ-like in our character... We should also expect to suffer as our Saviour did. You think about all the persecution that Jesus faced. The opposition he faced as as people plotted against him. As he was opposed by the religious leaders. As people did indeed even bring false accusation against him. He faced even opposition for healing someone. Just because they didn't like the fact he'd done that on the Sabbath day. And yet of course that opposition continued to build. We know where it ultimately led, 
until they had this crucifixion. When they looked for people to, to he was arrested on false charges. They accused him of being a, a kind of, of revolutionary, of trying to basically make himself an earthly king. But the kingdom Jesus was building, he was not trying to build a, a revolution against the, the Romans. His message certainly was, was revolutionary and life transforming, but he was building a heavenly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. That's the kind of kingdom Jesus was building. When he was arrested, he was beaten, spat and crucified. Spat upon and crucified. John fifteen twenty. Jesus reminds his disciples, disciples that a servant isn't greater than his master. So if they persecuted him, then they'd persecute them too. See again that emphasis. Jesus was saying to his disciples, be prepared. Be ready if you're seeking to live for me. Be prepared to face these things. He challenged others by saying, He who doesn't take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Paul too sought to prepare other believers for that reality. 2 Timothy 3.12 says these words, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Notice that it doesn't say might. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We know that might take many forms for us even in our world today. In the book of Acts, you know, Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city in Lystra. And he continued to to preach the gospel and strengthen those believers. He, He urged them to continue in your faith. And here's what he said to them after that painful experience in his life. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. In other words, trouble's real. We're going to face it. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer Bonhoeffer was one who knew the inevitability of suffering. He was a theologian, a a writer and pastor from Germany who ministered during the rise of the Nazis. He never seemed to waver in his opposition, even to that regime, although it meant for him imprisonment, even the threat of torture. It brought danger for his own family and even finally death. He was executed at the order of Heinrich Himmler, in 1945 in the concentration camp, just only a few days before it was about to be liberated. It was the fulfillment of what he always believed and taught. And here's what he said, suffering then is the badge of true discipleship. The disciple is not above his master. In other words, Christ suffered, so don't be surprised if we suffer for the sake of the gospel. Following Christ means suffering because we have to suffer. That is why Luther reckons suffering among the marks of the true church. And one of the memoranda drawn up in preparation for the the confession similarly defines the church as the community of those who are persecuted and martyred for the gospel's sake. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. It's therefore not not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon them to suffer. In fact, it is a joy And a token of his grace. But don't make the mistake of thinking somehow that when we suffer that this does not affect Christ. Do you remember how Paul was addressed on the road to Damascus? Saul was one who had persecuted people. People had been thrown in prison. He'd stood by even when Stephen was killed. And yet what was it that Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Whenever we are persecuted, we do that for for Christ's sake. It's for Christ's sake. When Paul was arresting, you know, Jesus was the one who, who said these words, you, Saul, I'm the one who you are persecuting. I'm the one. When you hurt these Christians, you're you're hurting me. So when these believers were being hurt, when believers are hurt, it's against Christ himself. People are rejecting. When they reject the message, they're rejecting Christ. But how should we respond when faced with persecution? You know, when faced with persecution, it would be very easy for us to grow downhearted and even depressed. Or simply to lick our wounds. But we aren't also, let's take the other extreme... We aren't just simply, to, the message here isn't just simply grin and bear it. That's not what we're told. 
Jesus also doesn't advocate us retaliating either because we're not to react in the same way that someone else would who's not a believer. That's not the way to respond. Instead, Jesus tells us, rejoice and be glad. And his words in verse 12 are certainly surprising because for us, persecution doesn't seem like a cause for rejoicing, does it? Doesn't seem like a reason for gladness. Yet Jesus is telling us that as disciples, we can rejoice knowing that our reward is great in heaven. You know, you may be suffering here and now, but you know what? You've got a great reward awaiting you. And nothing's going to take that away. Christians have been imprisoned. And people may be able to destroy the Christian's physical body, but they'll never destroy or separate them from God. They'll never take away that reward that is theirs in heaven. You know, here, you know, the Bible is giving us so much encouragement. Jesus says these words because he knows without any doubt the reward in heaven will by far compensate for any suffering this world is going to have to offer. Any suffering that anyone can dream of, this reward in heaven by far is going to exceed it. See, when Paul wrote to some other discouraged and persecuted believers in Thessalonica, he encouraged them not only by reminding them that God was going to bring justice upon those who would persecute them, but he encourages them by reminding them that there will be a day when Christ comes uh, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired amongst all those who believe. There's a day when Christ is coming for the church. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Jesus is encouraging us, in other words, to to look beyond your present circumstances and look ahead and consider the heavenly reward that's ours. It's laid up for us in heaven. Think of how many others have have faced that. People like Richard Wormbrand, when imprisoned, how he could have that hope. And he knew they could destroy his body, but they're never going to take that reward away from them. They could do many things, but they'll never separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Peter gave the same encouragement to persecuted Christians. 1 Peter 4.13 But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Meaning that we, when we are persecuted, we're being persecuted for Christ's sake. that That you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. There's further encouragement here, even that Jesus gives in verse 12. Because when we suffer, do you know, we stand in good company. Meaning, what we're facing is not something unusual or unique to us. It's been faced by many before us. Many others have walked that road before. The prophets he talks of here. And here we're given, you see, two encouragements. That while we suffer here and now, there there is a great eternal uh, weight of glory which no one can take away. That reward of fellowship will not just be in heaven, being in a place that's perfect, a place where there is no sin, where there's no more sickness, no more aches and pains, a place where first and foremost Christ is going to be there himself and God is going to be there and we'll enjoy that perfect fellowship. But an encouragement of knowing that others have walked this road before us. This is not something new, not something unique. And so what an honor it is to suffer for the Lord to suffer for his sake, to know that he endured even far more for us. Though we may be surrounded by people opposing us or opposing the gospel, so was Jesus. Though we may be accused, even falsely accused, so was Jesus. Though we may be mocked, so was Jesus. But what a glory it is to suffer for the Lord. And so we must be willing to do that to be willing to take our stand, even if it means persecution. You know, is it any wonder that often amongst sometimes the most persecuted countries, actually the gospel goes forth even more? Think about, I mentioned it about in Peter's time. They had sought to persecute the early church, to, to separate them. And what had happened? Did they destroy the gospel? Did they stop their witness? Not at all, because actually those ambassadors for Christ were now scattered in all these different locations. In in actuality, God was sovereign in that regard, because here's what happened. The gospel went forth to all those places. Do you know, we are facing challenging times at the moment, even we are. In many ways, we're only at the tip of the iceberg, really. So many 
Christians are facing great challenges today and other countries as well too. It is getting steadily difficult for people to voice biblical opinions without facing opposition. You know, people can be Christians, but people will say to us, you know, yes, you can hold that view, but, oh, but if you express it publicly, oof, that's another matter. You know, we live in a world where tolerance is valued. But here's the thing, sadly, that tolerance only seems to work in one direction. Doesn't it? Yet praise God for the encouragement of Jesus here. That those persecuted in this world for Christ will receive a great reward in heaven. Do you know one day, look down those list of blessings once more in those Beatitudes. We will inherit the kingdom of heaven. We will be comforted. We will inherit the earth. We will be satisfied. We will receive mercy. We will see God. We will be our sons of God. We will have this kingdom of heaven. This will be ours. I've entitled this little series that The Good Life, wasn't it? Because it was a, a blessed life. What it truly means to live a blessed life. We've seen the character of those who, who live that blessed life as we walk with the Lord. And may God encourage us with this knowledge that if we are in Christ, the reward is ours. And nothing's going to take it away. Let us look to the Lord. In the midst even of these ever-changing days. To fix our eyes in Christ. The one who never changes. I want to close tonight with a a hymn. Which proclaims a glorious truth of of God's sovereignty. His faithfulness. Even amidst times of suffering. And I think we have done this uh, before. But the words of this are beautiful. It's a modern hymn called Sovereign Over Us. And the words in this are truly precious. And if you are going through a difficult time at the moment, I do pray that these words will be a help and encouragement to you as we close singing them together. Let's stand as we sing this. strength within the sorrow There's beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust oh your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood You're faithful forever, perfect in love, and you are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimagined, who could understand your ways? high above the heavens reaching down in endless grace you're the lifter of the lowly compassionate and kind you surround and you uphold me Promises are my delight. Oh, your plan to still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Your faithful.
pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks that you are the sovereign Lord. We want to give you thanks, Lord, even for the encouragement and the promises even we find in these wonderful Beatitudes. Father, how they even speak even to the reality of life. But because we are all in the Christian life, it doesn't mean we won't face trials. But Father, even what the enemy means for evil, Father, you can turn it for our good. Even how you've done that in the past, even through persecution, how that has been the means of even the the message of the gospel going forth. And Father, we do pray that you'll help us to be faithful to you in these difficult days. Father, grant us wisdom even as how we speak and how we respond, even in circumstances, even such as this. And Father, just we do pray that you will help us as we consider even God willing next week of of what it means to be salt and light. That you'll help us to be even as lights in this dark world. Father, you sent your Son to be the light of the world. How glorious that is. Father, help us as we do seek to live for you. And Father, we want to give you thanks that even the great reward that is laid aside for us in heaven, Father, nothing can take that away. Nothing can separate us from yourself. And so, Lord, you truly are faithful forever. So, Lord, encourage us even with these words, even in the week ahead. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.